Right, so that's the passage we're looking at. So great to see you all. So many people here today. We're, we're increasing in our numbers. If you're home, know this. This is a safe place. You can come. If you feel safe, uh, we want you to come. So we're, we're watching our numbers rise in terms of attendance, and it's so good to see you in person, see babies in person. So uh, great to be with you all. You can grab your Bible if you want to turn to John 4 is where we're going to be. Uh, whether, wherever you are at home, I'm going to ask, ask this question, the ancient philosophical question. Uh, if, a, if a tree falls in the forest and no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound, right? If someone speaks and no one really listens, are they saying anything? You ever feel like we live in a culture that just doesn't listen very well? How do we listen like Jesus in a society that refuses to listen? And how can we live questionable lives as it relates to the way that we extend grace to one another? I want you to do this for a moment. I want you to just close your eyes right where you are. I'm not going to get too weird, but just for a moment, close your eyes just to focus, okay? And listen. So what did you hear? There's a difference between hearing and listening. Listening requires a focus, you know, wherever you're listening from. There's not much noise in this room, but you start to be aware of other things going on around you. And today we're going to talk about this. Scott Peck uh, wrote that you can't really listen to someone if you're doing anything else. That's convicting, isn't it? Some of you are on the phone like, wait, what did, wait, what did he just say? What was, what, what was that? What did he, was he talking to me, Right? And so today we're going to talk about how we can listen better. And this is going to be so helpful for you. If you listen to this message, it's going to change your relationships. I don't mind telling you if you're married or dating. So it's going to change your life. Contrary to popular opinion, Jesus was not the answer man. I mean, he is the answer, but he was really the question man. You might know that Jesus actually asked 307 questions. He was asked 183 questions and he only answered three of them. What's going on there? Jesus in conversation was a listener. He was totally focused on whoever was right in front of him. And then he would ask questions, I think often leading to self-discovery is what it was. Like the spirit of God is going to speak to you here. And we can do the same. So we're going to talk quite a bit about that. It's about a year ago, maybe more. I read Mary Oliver, who is a um, Pulitzer Prize winning poet, wrote this. She said, attention is the beginning of devotion. I thought a lot about that. Attention is the beginning of devotion. I thought about my relationships, like with Stacy and others in my life. I thought about worship, and I thought focus is the beginning of worship. Some of you today, truthfully, we've struggled to worship because we haven't really been focused. And I just want to challenge us to focus in, as, as Han was praying earlier, that we might focus in and live different lives because of the way we listen. Listening is powerful. I don't know if you've ever heard a sermon on listening, but here we go. It was Leslie Newbigin, who's one of my favorite missiologists, theologians. I've offered this, um, this quote from him in this series. Live, the kingdom, live in the kingdom of God in such a way that it provokes questions for which the gospel is the answer. I'm challenging us in these days, leading up to Easter and beyond, to live questionable lives. Like people see us and go, wait, why, what? Why are you serving me? Why do you, why do you listen to me? Who am I? And we're going to see this today. Jesus teaches us how to, to listen. So you know that we're walking through this, as, as TJ noted, uh, these, these uh, weeks up to Easter, we're going through this acrostic really called bless because it's so powerful. And we're going to keep, keep uh, living this out as we go into the year. And we've said that we begin with prayer. That, that's the challenge for many of us. We don't begin with prayer and then we just rush in, right? And then everything goes kind of crazy in our relationship. Begin with prayer. Keep praying for people in your life. Listen well. We're going to talk about that today. Eat with them. Okay, have coffee with them, right? Uh, talk to them, spend time with them. It may be a phone call these days, but serve them and then share your story with them. Share the story, the gospel story in the end. We're going to talk about that as we move into uh, the days to Easter and learn how to bless people. All right, so John chapter four um, places this in context where we're going to look at Jesus speaking to this woman at the well. You probably know this story, maybe the Samaritan woman. And we're going to learn today that we are challenged by Jesus to listen to the person, okay? Listen to the heart 
and listen to the Spirit as we have conversations with people. This is going to transform your family, transform your relationships, and it's going to bless those we're seeking to bless. All right, so first, let's talk about it. Listen to the person. When you look at the life of Jesus, again, he was totally focused on whoever was right in front of him. Jesus was often, I say this, I say this often, but he was often busy, but he was never in a hurry. Two very different things here. And he knew that every person standing in front of him, like you and me, they, we are all created in what we call the Imago Dei, the image of God. Every person that you know, every person you're seeking to bless, every person that makes you crazy, every person you disagree with was created in God's image, and he loves them. And he's calling you to love them. You will not lock eyes with anyone this week or in, the, in your life for whom Jesus did not die. Every person. And he's seeking to draw them to himself. So Jesus here in this passage, he's, John has told us he's growing in popularity and uh, grabs, this grabs the attention of the Pharisees. And then in verse four, it says, and he had to pass through Samaria. Now this is not just, well, that's the way to go because that's not the way Jews went. If you know this story at all, he's going to Galilee. Jews would go around Samaria. There's a, the, the language here is he had a moral obligation to go through. In other words, Jesus is going to a place where he knows he, he doesn't belong. Uh, he's not supposed to be there in order to bless people that he's not supposed to be around. And we can live our lives that way too. We can go out of our way to bless people who don't look like us, be with people who aren't like us. We can go out of our way as Jesus did here. You probably know that Samaritans were, uh, they were an ethnic minority, really hated minority uh, group. There was racism going on and the Jews, any righteous Jew would not hang out with the Samaritan. They were half-breeds from the exile. Long history of hatred between the groups and a big divide. And then in verse 5 it says, So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour, so that's noon as the way they measure time. Jesus, the man, is worn out, dehydrated, exhausted. All right? Verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city down to the Sychar Chipotle to buy food. All right. I'm just seeing if y'all listening. Okay. Um, it's, it's important to note here. Uh, this is a request. This sounds like Jesus just chilling and he's like, woman, give me a drink. Yo, you know, bring it. Uh, that's not what's going on. This is a, this is a request, not a command. So what's happening is this is a daily conversation. And what's crazy is I want you to see this is an incredible act of grace. I'm guessing they have not locked eyes until Jesus speaks. She she knows he's a Jew. She knows he's not supposed to talk to her. Jesus does something that's not socially acceptable at all. And he speaks to this woman. A man, sorry, speaking to a woman in this culture. And she is a Samaritan. He is a Jew. So then in verse 9, look at this. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. I'm giving you a little bit of that context there. She's shocked. You see that? She's shocked that he would even talk to her. Like, who am I that I could offer you anything? Is kind of what she's feeling or sensing. Or don't you believe that? And Jesus is there not so she might offer him something, but he might offer her something. If we go into conversations that way, if we listen to people, not let me lay something on you, let me drop some science, drop some theology or some truth on you, and said, hey, I just want to listen. It's one of the most incredible ways that you can show respect and extend grace to another person, even as you're doing now, to say what you're saying is more important than me speaking. But too often we listen with an intent to respond instead of with an intent, an intent to understand and to simply listen. Right? This is what Jesus is doing, and watch where this goes. She's shocked that, she, that he would even talk to her, and, and so now he's, he's living this questionable life. And she's asking questions like, wait, why are you even talking to me? See, his love now creates this curiosity in her, and, and he sees her as a person. Now watch this. Here's the point here. Not as a race, an ethnicity, not as a history, not a background, not a label. Think about this. Jesus does not categorize this woman. And I just want to, you know, confession. I think all of us here, we do this all the time. 
We label people the moment we see them. What age they are, right? We label people based on whether, I mean, you're watching the news or checking out something online and you're looking at something, maybe it's a political thing. We've had some of that going on this week, right? And, and you're looking at this and we categorize people. Ah, are they an R or a D? Ah, D, I'm out. R, no, you know, whatever your, your thing is, right? Or maybe they're, they're black or white or Asian. We've seen a lot of you know, hatred towards Asian in these days. People are like, you're Asian, so, and they don't even know them. And there's, there are these um, crimes against Asians we're seeing, but you might know somebody there. Well, they're Hispanic or, they're, or whatever they are, and we label people. I want you to watch for that this week. Do you do that? We tend to make judgments before we ever talk to people. In fact, it's strange to me, in these days, it seems that we categorize people uh, so much in terms of politics that some people, Christians, have more, they think, in common, more at home with people who share their political ideology or view than they do believers who share their faith in Jesus. We ought to be a lot more home with people, at home with people who are pursuing Jesus, you know, fall, running after him, who are not in our political party, if you will. I know people who are on all sides of the political spectrum. I don't know if you do. I mean, who are Christians, who are seeking the Lord. And we've come to a place where, wait, so you're, you're like, you're Republican? You, I don't even know if you're saved. You know, you're, wait, you're a Democrat? Not in my family. And that's nuts when you think about it. The thing that unites us is Jesus, right? And, and so how is it, how do, we, how do we live in a culture like this? How, how do we, you know, what does it look like to, to love people we disagree with? No, I'm going to talk about that for a moment because this is such a big thing. See, for instance, and this is on the minds of a lot of people this week. Society tells us that if we love LGBTQ people, then we have to reject uh, a historical Christian biblical sexual ethic. Many of us know LGBTQ people. We have them as friends or classmates or in our families, and we love them, and they love us. So we know that's not the case, that we can hold fast to biblical truth and at the same time love them, right? Love and compassion don't demand agreement. And we know, I know this is challenging in our culture, but we've got to, to love people well, but it doesn't mean that we agree with them. And I know that's hard with many in the LGBTQ community who say, well, you don't agree with my sexual preference or whatever else. So you don't love me. That is not the case. And we've got to stand on the word of God. Oftentimes, it, it doesn't demand agreement, but it does demand social action. And so as God's people, we do seek uh, you know, laws that would, would help people not to be discriminated against. And we seek the welfare of all people. We're called to love our neighbors, all neighbors, while standing on our Christian convictions, you see, we can have compassion and conviction. And so this week, you probably know the Equality Act made its way through Congress, which, um, frankly, if it passes through the Senate, it's going to be devastating for religious liberty in our country. And this is where this is heading. You know, you can, you can see it, and particularly activists, not all LGBTQ people, but certainly activists are are not, not wanting another alternative. It's just going to keep, let's just keep going. And it will be very challenging, particularly for Christian businesses and perhaps even churches and schools, universities. And so we need to stand for truth. You know, is there an alternative? I talked to a lot of people this week, a lot of attorneys, a lot of friends, experts in this arena. I'm not one, but it sure seems that the Fairness for All Act is a better alternative, though it too is wonky and is challenging in, in our day. I just know that, that there are challenges to come. But, but my point is this. For instance, the Fairness for All Act um, seems like a better alternative if there are only two alternatives, lesser of, of evils, it seems. But it was put together in Utah by Mormons, a group of Mormons, and a group of LGBTQ leaders who came together, watch this, actually listened to one another to say, how can we do this to come to a, an agreement that protects religious liberty and protects LGBTQ people, you know, when it comes to things like housing and workplace, you know, protection or social services, financial credit, those kind of things that, that matter. See, disagreement, friends, is not the same as, dis, as discrimination. 
And we need to help those in the LGBTQ community to understand that. That we can, we do love, but we also, with our friends and those that we know, we need to listen well first. Because, you know, often we want to just drop the truth on you. We know you're wrong, but that's exactly what we claim others are doing. But the problem with activists in the LGBT community is that they've determined that their entire identity is found in sexual preference, sexual desire. We know that's not the case. Our identity is found because we've been created in the image of God, every person on the planet. And ultimately, our identity is found in Christ, and his love for us is what defines us. Not my preference, not my sexual desires, but instead him. That's fixed. Once we come to Christ, that is fixed and does not change. And so we need to point our friends to Jesus But we need to start by not labeling people, even as Jesus did with this woman, that he's not supposed to be talking to. He saw her as a person, not a category, not a label. How do you do that? Are you doing that? And this week, be challenged to do that. We listen to the person. Secondly, look at this. We listen to the heart. Okay. Now, with empathy, uh, without distraction, Jesus is focused. and And he's now listening to her. Look at verse 10. Jesus answered her. Hey, if you knew the gift of God, Who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, this is awesome. Jesus, of course, knows her needs. I mean, think about it. It's not you're like, well, he's Jesus. Of course he knows. No, no, no. He knows she's a Samaritan. She's been shamed. She's coming, many scholars say, at this time of the day, so she didn't see anybody. And then a Jewish man shows up, and she's like, oh my gosh. And then he reaches out to her and loves her. But empathy means that you put yourself in their position. You put yourself in their own skin. You see the world through their eyes. You you feel through their heart. You, 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 You understand what it's like to be them. This is the great commandment, to love God comprehensively and to love people as we love ourselves, put ourselves in their position. What would it be like to be, you know, young in this in this context? What would it be like to be really old in this setting that I'm in? What would it be like to be black in this particular office? Or the, What would it be like to be that person? You know, to be different, altogether different. What would it be like to be, how about this? What would it be like to be female right here in this place? What would it be like to be female in this office, in this workplace? And to have empathy towards those and seek to understand. You might go, well, how would I know? I'm not, I'm not Jesus. Okay, two things. Ask, (laughs) ask what it's like. That would be a good place. And listen, you see, listening is powerful. In fact, I'm going to revolutionize your marriage right now. Men, listen up. I want want you to hear something because I learned this. I'm still learning. Sorry, mass confession. I'm still learning how to listen to Stacy well, because I know the first step for me to love her is to listen to her well. And you can imagine, as a talker and as pastor, dude, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to speak. And what I've learned through, we, we do this with premarital counseling. We do it when we talk to couples. When she and I are talking to couples or we do it here in our premarried, you know, courses, we talk about the importance of listening. And one of the things that I've learned is this, and guys, and know this, and women, this will help you too. But while you're talking, gals, you're, you're waxing eloquently or sharing your feelings. Many guys are, are listening. We're trying. We're We're trying. If we put the phone down, right, or start TV, whatever else, we're listening. But what's going on in the mind of the guy you're talking away? And he's going, get to the point. Okay, get to the the point. What is the point? And already he's thinking, because you're sharing with him, he's thinking, uh, get to the point or stop talking because I've already got three points and I know exactly what you need to do because you're telling me this because I need to fix the problem. I can fix this problem. Stop talking. I'm ready to fix the problem. And men, listen, here's what's changed my relationship with Stacy. Uh, when I'm going, get to the point, that is the point. Listening to her is the point. Validating her feelings and what she's feeling is the point. It's not for you. To, you're not that awesome, by the way. You're not that brilliant. And she's not sharing with you simply to fix the problem. But here's what Stacy does. Now, gals, this will help you. Stacy does this periodically. Hey, um, I want to share something with you. I don't want you to fix it. I just want you to hear me. And I'm telling you, that sets me free to go, okay, wow. Evidently, I do that. 
Um, so I'm going to listen. And it is powerful. So dudes, take notes, all right? And gals, practice that. Sorry, men, practice that. Tell him to just be quiet and listen. So we think, you know, she's looking for validation. Hey, we're all looking for that. For men, we call it affirmation, probably. But we all are looking, does somebody really understand me? Is anyone really listening to me? Because we know that's the first step towards devotion, first step towards listening. Jesus knew this woman was thirsty. How did he know? Well, because he's Jesus. No, because she's human. And she's dying inside. We haven't yet seen exactly what's going on, but he offers this thing of, hey, uh, you, you know, we got the well here, but there's living water to come. And this doesn't mean in every conversation you offer, you know, kind of the Jesus juke, you know? Like, well, this is a great burger. Hey, I got a better burger for you. Jesus is the better burger. Like, what? What was that? You don't know. But what he's doing here is he's getting to the heart of her problem. Because she is saying, I'm, you know, she's, she's dying inside. She's thirsty inside. And so Jesus goes to an old reference that she would have known. Evidently, she's theologically astute. We've come to discover. But in Jeremiah 2.13, it says this. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Listen, here's the truth about all your four people or beyond that you're seeking to bless. Every person I'm praying for, every person you're praying for, every person in your life is like you and me. They're, they're trying to draw from broken cisterns. I don't care how successful they look, what's up with them. They are desperate. And her broken cisterns were broken relationships with men. And as we're going to see, you pr- perhaps you know this story. Jesus is listening to what she really needs, is my point. But we've got to listen. I heard a great story this week um, of a group that was going on a mission trip from a church. And uh, actually, I read this. They were, they were going to this village, and they were ready to, to serve on a foreign mission trip, and all excited, and coming with you know, a lot of things they could bring. They brought construction and all kinds of you know, tools and everything else, going to build something. And a bunch of men were on the trip as well and coming to say, you know, we're coming in to rescue you. We love you. In the name of Jesus, we're going to build something. And, um, and they were talking and, and you know, really talking to the leaders there and like, hey, we're, we're here to do this. We can build a school. Man, we can build a, uh, a church. You want to, we need a church. We're going to build a, we build a hospital. We can build, we're here to build something. What is it that you all need? And when they asked that question, the answer was, we need a mailbox. That's what we need. I mean, well, what? Yeah, mailbox. Because see, without a mailbox, uh, we don't have a zip code. We don't have a postal code. Without a zip code, we're not on the map. And without being on the map, we don't get social services that could help our people across the board. And if we're not here, we don't have a mailbox, then we don't exist. We need a mailbox. I saw that this week, this past week, when the snow came, we're all hunkered down just trying to survive in our homes. And I get on the phone, we're trying to figure out what are we going to do because we know that a crisis comes and the most vulnerable are going to be in trouble. We got no water, we got no heat. You know, a lot of us are like, well, but what do we do? We can't even hardly get out. And so we're thinking, what can we do? We've got to do something. And so I gathered the team together and I thought, well, you know what? We need, we need Jessica Lambert on the call. Because we're seeking to bless our friends in Vickery, in particular, where we have deep relations. We lift, we've listened for a long, for years we've been listening. I get Jessica Lambert on the call, and she says, I just got off the phone with Sandra Barrios. And I'm like, I, I'm not surprised. The principal at Jack Lowe Elementary. And then, then the conversation goes, here's what they need. Uh, and here's what they don't need. And it helped us to say, here's how we can help. And you all help big time. It's why we're even now collecting beans and rice to sustain people who've been hit so hard. Even in just that week or so, they've lost much. And we're here for the long haul because we're listening. It's how we do ministry here. It's how you should live your life, every single relationship you're in. In fact, in his landmark book, When Helping Hurts, which is subtitled How to Alleviate Poverty Without Hurting the Poor, uh, Steve Corbett says a lot of times churches and others, we go in to help and we actually end up hurting because we're not listening. Same is true in your relationships. Look what happens. A key question here um, that I want you to, to, to consider is, is, is that here's, here's probably application, another application today. This question, how can I help? It's that. In your marriage, in your relationships, in, with your roommate, with friends, how can I help? It's a powerful question. 
to extend grace to others. Look at verse 11. The woman said all right, to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He, he gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and livestock. Who are you to help me? We might, you know, our friends may ask the same. Hey, I'm just a loving friend, that's all. I'm just a listening ear. But he's prompting curiosity because of his empathy. Look at verse uh, 13. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. You can see that this water, then you never, you're never thirsty again. Never, ever again. And then look at verse 15. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here again. Now, clearly she needs food and water. Jesus needs food and water here. He needs water to drink. But he's getting to a deeper matter because you see, everyone we know needs this living water. I want to offer four real practical steps here, okay? I want you to write these down if you're taking notes. Four practical helps that kind of are summarized here in this passage. First, be humble. Be humble. I think you've heard that a bit. Jesus, the King of Kings, he's descending into our world, all right? Humble posture. Listen and listen to learn from others before you speak. Be patient. You'll probably never impart a fact or a wisdom that'll impact another person greater than, than listening, it was um, Maya Angelou who said, people will not remember what you said. They won't remember what you did. They will remember how you made them feel. And that comes through listening well. Be curious. Again, we talked about that. Ask questions. Be genuinely curious, though, to go deeper, to understand what's going on in their lives. And then be clear. And what I mean by that, make, you, know, you could repeat what they've said. You hear this in communication you know, courses or whatever else, but summarize what you've heard. And then after five minutes or so, they're going, wow, you really were listening to me. And even if they're, and especially if it's hard conversations, then find common ground, you know, points of agreement. There's always something, right? So we listen to the person, we listen to the heart, and then I'll close with this. Finally, listen to the spirit. Listen to the spirit to guide our conversations. Look at verse 16. Jesus said to her, uh, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you're right in saying you have no husband. You've had five husbands and the one you're with now, the man you live with now is not your husband. What you said is true. And I think there's a lot of compassion in his voice, by the way. He's not pointing his finger at her. And the woman said to him, I, I perceive that you're a prophet. And Jesus answered, what was your first clue? And um, he didn't. See, I'm just, again, you're still listening. All right. This woman is a mess morally, Right? She has been with many men, and behind her desperate need uh, is one for love, true love. And so look at verse 20. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Now, check this out. Um, you know, you've had a lot of husbands. You, the man you're living with now is not your husband. And then she goes, hey, you know about worship, um, it's, you know, right? It seems like she's, this is great diversion. I'm not so sure that it is because I think she's staying right on track with what her greatest need is, and it's to worship God. She's basically saying, I can't worship in Jerusalem because of you guys, Jews, and I can't worship here, evidently. So what am I supposed to do if I'm going to worship God? And in verse 21, Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. He's saying you can worship God anywhere. And then in verse 22, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know for salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. So to this half-breed, rejected woman of society, Jesus offers the most profound words he would offer on worship. Look at verse 24. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. Watch this. She's got her theology right. He's called the Christ. When he comes, he's going to tell us everything. She's like, I don't know what you're talking about, but he's coming. And he's going to set things right. And then Jesus says to her, look at this. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. The one speaking, I am. 
the very one she's looking for is right here. Here's my point, friends. As we talk to people, we listen to the person. We listen to their heart with empathy. But always remember this. There's the third person in the conversation. Don't miss that. There's always a third person. So I would begin with prayer. And so as we go into the world today, I want us to remember that Jesus truly is the answer for all of us. Because like the woman, we have broken cisterns that we're drawing from. And if you're here today and you've never received Christ, you know, you, all of us can relate to the woman. But if you feel that you're ashamed by the things of your past, maybe feel that there's a judgmental spirit coming at you, know that here, at least, this is a place of grace. And Jesus loves you. Here's the beautiful thing. When you come to Jesus, he does not condemn you. He seeks to draw you to his grace to be forgiven because he died on the cross for you. And he rose again so that you could live a life in power over sin in your life and so that you might join him in eternity. What is your broken cistern? What's the well you run to? Is it approval? Think about that. Let the spirit speak to you. Is it, is it success? Is it popularity? Is it performance in some area of your life? What well are you running to? Because it's broken and it will never be the living water you're looking for. Jesus comes to us and in him, watch this, our judgment moves from the future to the past because Christ has taken upon himself our judgment so that we could be forgiven and live forgiven. So we've intentionally left off the rest of the story. A sidecar, I mean, in sidecar, a revival breaks out. Jesus stays there for a couple of days. Imagine that preaching away all because of this woman all because Jesus listened and then she went and told others I met him I met him I want to challenge us all to live questionable lives this week let's love people in a way where they just don't fully understand the gospel is the only answer and so let's let's do this let's pray as we close our time together just to commit Not to rush in this moment to get on to the next thing, but be focused to be here, to be present. So if a tree were to fall in the forest and no one's there to hear it, would it make a sound? How many people in your life are fallen, broken, falling, and maybe you've not been listening? Lord, I pray that'd be true in my life. I want to be a better listener. Lord, help us to be people who listen well, who extend grace to others. Love people with empathy and to hear their hearts as your spirit guides us and leads us. And friend, if you're listening to my voice and you may wonder, you're questioning your relationship with Jesus, I want to just join others who are praying with you and for you right now. To say, give Christ your life. He died on the cross for you. Say yes to him. By faith, receive his grace and his forgiveness. Stop going to broken wells. And receive the living water. The bread of life. So Lord, we give you our lives to go forth. To listen well. To love well to be light and salt in the world this week. And we pray it in Jesus' name.